guys for coming. Uh, there's quite a lot of you. I always think when I do CSS talks that we won't have a lot of people. And for some reason, a lot of people are coming to them. Maybe it's because we love CSS so much, maybe this is a big pain in our butts. Did you turn your mic on? All right. Justin, did you turn your mic on? Yeah, mic's on, and it's on the hold position, so we'll check that right now. So I'll on accident turn it on. Recording. All right. Okay. So, what we're talking about, demystifying CSS for developers. Um, super quick rundown about me. Uh, this is actually inaccurate. Technically, as of now, I'm unemployed. I am starting a new job next week as the Director of Development for Desert News. Uh, I used to be the Chief Technology uh, Officer for a company called Dating DNA. We did dating, talk, we did dating website and a bunch of iPhone apps. And then I also used to do contract work and was kind of the CIO for a company called Sivo. We did uh, we do, uh, video gaming websites, in particular competitive gaming, so like StarCraft 2 tournaments, you know, Counter-Strike, PS2, Better Culture Boat. Probably run a tournament for it. Um, I've been doing web development for quite a while. <clears throat> kind of a hobbyist. Come on in. Don't worry, you're not late. I'm early. And uh, and we've uh, I've been a hobbyist since '97. I want to say how old I was, maybe how old I was then. But I've been doing professions since 2005. Um, and if you want to read more about what I write, what I do, or more about CSS, uh, you can check out the blog. I would be the one Joseph Scott was making fun of. Right? I would have been there, except I hurt my back really bad. And so I was more like this, and you know, right in the speaker room, and ready to puke. But yes. So if I can have to ask you after we said that. He gave me a hard time. He's like, why weren't you there? Oh my god, I was about to puke. I'm glad I'm feeling a lot better now. All right. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll do a quick little survey. Okay, in the room, how much do you guys know about CSS? Who here falls into the none category? We have one or two people. That's, okay, that's fine. How many fall into a little? Okay, the vast majority. And who, who here knows a lot? Get ready to answer questions. Whoa. Oh, that's not good. Okay, this talk, I'll be straightforward to you. It's more of a focus for a none to a little. Um, we do go over a lot of fundamentals. Uh, so I, I've had people who know a lot with CSS are still find pretty worthwhile. Um, but I will tell you, if it's really below your pay grade, and if you need to duck it out, um, I will not be offended. Um, but uh, we're going to go ahead and start off with my absolute favorite topic, topic and that is why people hate CSS. And who would fall underneath this category? Like, you have a hatred or at least a love-hate relationship with CSS. I like All CSS. Right. I hate using CSS. Okay. I hate when I personally have to use CSS. Yes. Part of the point. Yeah. You know, and, and, and you know what? Honestly, there is some good reason for this. Um, there are these things called browsers, and you can't seem to get along at all. This is it all. You know, the good thing is that it's getting a lot better. Um, IE6, I still think it's still amazing me how it looks like yeah. it, but it's dying finally. Uh, and maybe Windows XP will lose some float somehow. But, you know, there are some serious problems with plug in browsers, but it is getting better. Um, there's also, you know, a lot of times people drive into CSS, especially when someone's starting off like the WordPress. You go to edit the CSS, and this is what you see, and you're like, I have no idea what this means. And it can be kind of confusing at first, especially if you're trying to edit something. Uh, honestly, sometimes it is user error. Uh, a lot of times we don't understand exactly how CSS works, and I find a lot of bugs are due to a lack of understanding versus a bug in the browser. Um, and the problem is, uh, from a lot of people, you end up just kind of giving up. You say, you know what, CSS isn't for me. We'll hire a really smart front end guy, he'll take care of it, and then I'll come in and break it, and then he can come back and fix it. And, you know, but the thing is, do not give up. CSS is, is a good thing, it's, it's, it's awesome. You know, I, I had a thing that used to say, you can pass, and then I dropped it. So, <laughs> and it says, can, you can pass, yeah. Anyway, I was a picture. 
But, uh, you know, there is, um, you know, CSS, what makes it difficult is that it solves a unique problem um, that isn't very common in, in, in information technology. It's kind of a unique thing. Uh, but how many of you ever watched The Big Bang Theory? You, you're familiar with it. CSS is Sheldon. He's weird, he's quirky, but after you get to understand and know him, he makes perfect sense in his craziness. Like once you understand, so the, the solution really is to have a better understanding of CSS. And you know, once like all his friends, you understand him, he's very, very, very predictable. You know exactly how he's going to react. And so we're going to go up and cover a bunch of these different understandings of CSS and hopefully help clear up some misconceptions and help make it so you hate CSS less, and at least when you run into a problem or a bug, you have a better understanding of what's going on. Okay? A couple quick things. Feel free to ask questions during the presentation. Uh, I prepared this for 45 minutes, and we have an hour, so we should have plenty of time for questions. And we'll go ahead and jump in. First, do we have any questions first off? Awesome. Oh. One of the big challenges I've seen is when you have multiple CSS files and trying to figure out which one rules. I hope you cover that at some point. We're going to cover that right now. I have a segue. I should pay you for that. Here's a dollar. You know. <laughs> Perfect segue. Okay. Selectors. CSS at its very core is all about selectors and rules. That's all it is. Um, and they're starting to get some more advanced stuff down the road. But at the very fundamentals, 99% of the time what you're doing, you're declaring selectors and, and rules. You have different types of selectors. And so in HTML, we have our tags. So like a P tag, paragraph tag. And so we have selector types. We have ele elements, which say, hey, any type of P tag, or div, or span, or whatever you want, that's fine. The next thing we have, we have classes. So that's like if you had your div, and you say class equals uh, post, or class equals author, or whatever. Um, then you have IDs. And then you have more advanced stuff. You have your pseudo classes and your pseudo elements. Uh, the most one you'll be most common with is with your A tag. It's like your links. You say, hey, when someone's visited, visited, visited um, you treat it differently than the one that's hovered over whatnot. But these are basically the four selector types that we have. So we're going to go ahead and practice. <coughs> Let's pretend we are a giant HTML document. We are not going to be rendering an IE, so we should work. <laughs> um, all of you should be attendees. And I should have changed this. Okay, well, how many of you here have blogs? If you have a blog, go ahead and uh, add the class blogger. Your right hand should be raised. Okay. If you are a developer, your left hand should be raised. If you are a developer and a blogger, because these are two different elements, <coughs> two different types, uh, both hands should be raised. And if you are the speaker, you're supposed to be laughing as you kill the audience. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So this is very, very simple. These are very, very simple examples. What the problem comes into is which rule to rule them all. Uh, out of these four, in fact, out of these four, don't say that as you, but how many of you know which one would, if, if we had an element that met all of these criteria, <coughs> which rule would be applied? We have one. Okay, excellent. All right, we're explain. So by the time we leave, Everyone should say, I know the answer to that. Okay. Commonly misunderstood thing, should be for everyone how to say this correctly, CSS specificity. Say it 10 times fast, I shouldn't say. <laughs> CSS specificity, all that is, is it's kind of like an order of operations for CSS. Instead of, you know, math, I times before I add, subtract. The same thing applies for CSS, and it's actually very, very straightforward. The problem is, People don't really understand it, and so they make it more harder and start throwing on extra tags and definitions and learning why nothing's working, and they make it a lot more convoluted than it needs to be. So the definition is the selector specificity is a process used to determine which rules take precedence in CSS when several rules could be applied to the same element in markup. Okay? And so the first step is there is a hierarchy. Inline styles come in first then ID selectors, then class selectors, then element selectors. Okay? Now, that might seem kind of weird, you know, kind of like, ah, uh, okay, there's a really easy way to learn this. You start with invaders, stormtroopers, and Sith Lords. And so, the way I look at it, 
And I can't take that idea for this. It's an article who did this, and I'm just using it, because I think it's a great way of explaining it. Element selectors are like your stormtrooper. You have lots of them be all over the place. Class selectors are your gators, your, um, and, and each one of these have different values, and then you have your Sith Lords. Now, element selectors have a value of 1, class selectors have a value of 10, and ID selectors have a value of 100. Now, you see these commas, and that's because a 10 is like a normal decimal 10. It really has its own special weight. And so, which is greater? 1 is greater than 0. 2 is greater than 1. It's really simple. One, ID, one class selector versus a, a rule that had 15 uh, element selectors in there. This one has a greater specificity. If you had uh, one, di one uh, ID, 99 class, 99 element, one big, big, big rule, a rule with two ID selectors, a trumpet would, be, would have a higher specificity. And so the visual way to visualize this <laughs> one stormtrooper, two stormtroopers equal, beat one stormtrooper. But, regardless of how many stormtroopers you have, a, a Darth Vader will always beat it. Unless he has a, 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 a class element selector. And then if he has two stormtroopers, it beats one, and on, so on and so forth. Where's the Jedi? <laughs> In the dark side. No, no, no. <laughs> this is the example he had. I didn't, I didn't make it. So, does this make sense? Does this seem pretty straightforward? Yep. It's almost like you compare, first you compare Sith Lords, and if, and, if, and if one has one or the other, automatic win. There's a tie, you compare your, your, your Vayners, and there's a tie there, you compare Stormtroopers. Okay. Say it? Okay, so it's really simple. And so that's the first step. So that's, that is, I just forget the definition. That is the, oh, I think it's the hierarchy. Okay, so the second part of hierarchy is, is when you have an equal specificity, you use the one that was last declared. And so in, in the case of the multiple documents, the last, if, if you have elements and there's two rules that are equal, the last one called, regardless of which document they are, whatever they're loaded into the DOM, that is the one that will be used. And the one that is unequal, they'll use the one that is more specific. Okay? All right, now, there's a great thing about this is that you don't have to be, when you're working, you don't need to pull out a calculator and go, okay, I got three Sith Lords and two Vaders and this, and this guy has, no, you don't worry about that. There are tools to help you do this, okay? Firefox is a thing called Firebug. And actually, I, just, I launched Firefox the other day, and this is the part of Firebug that's already integrated with Firefox. It's kind of through your loop. And so, but there's a tool called Firebug. Um, you can go down, go to getfirebug.com, you can download it. Do a quick aside, I'll have a companion article for this, and so if you don't worry about jotting stuff down really fast, I'll give you the link at the end. It has all the slides, all the, you'll probably link to the old video, I have all the articles I've used for my research, everything. So don't worry about keeping too many notes. The other one, develop, developer tools, it comes built in with Chrome, and what it looks like, well, this is Chrome, I think. Another thing too, yeah. with with Firefox, the newer version of Firefox has that same functionality, like what you can get with Firebug or with yeah. developer tools. Yeah, it's, they baked it in now. It threw me through. Okay, and so we'll, we, we went over here and I select this element, and over down here, really fancy, I can see its hierarchy and all the glory, all those different parents it has. And then over here, I see my styles, and match CSS styles. And so I can see, here's an ID, here's an element, so it's have a specificity of 101, and say, okay, here's the colors, here's the font sizes and stuff. And then I have my normal A tag, and I can see this thing's crossed out. And what that's saying is like, okay, these are being trumped by the declarations in this rule. And so if I was to sit here and say, I want to override this, I would know that I would need to have at least an ID and a class or two elements or declare it later with the same value. Does that make sense? Am I losing anyone? No? Excellent. Don't shake your head. Is 
there any reason you wouldn't just declare it last and start trying to figure out how to trump it? Um, the problem the problem that becomes is sometimes it's better to have things organized like sections like all my header stuff, but then at the very it, it depends. Uh, is I, I'm more looking at it is I want all my stuff regarding something in the same spot in my CSS files. And so, you know, it kind of just depends. Most of the time when I want to overwrite it, I'll just match it and try and declare it later. But if I can't, because it, it make my code look like spaghetti, then I'll say I'll just I'll have a more specific role. Okay? Just to add to that, not only that, but in a lot of cases you'll end up with a CSS file that's used throughout the entire site. And uh, it gets really, really difficult to just always do, you know, direct order when you've got 30 different pages and you've got things organized so that, you know, yeah. especially if you've got an Ajax-heavy site, you may be doing almost all of the front end and it's all one, you know, you've got like 40 pages, it's all one page. Yeah. So, it just kind of depends. And my thing is, once you understand it, you kind of get a better feel and you'll not make a few mistakes here, but at least when you... When you look at your website and you say, I want that to be black, but it's blue, why the is it blue? You can look over here and say, okay, I understand it's being trumped, and I know how I could possibly have read more specific roles. Okay? All right. Any questions about specificity? Mm. And you can always throw style equals in, in your markup. No, don't throw style equals. Ugh. Never, never. No, you don't. Style equals. Yeah. <laughs> For those who don't, when I shoot the designers, 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 yeah, it's, it's, it can become very difficult to, to maintain if you start writing the style equals and all over the place. Every now and then you might have a random reason that, you know, I, I'm not like a hard, fast, 100% always rule kind of guy. I'm more 95, 95% of the time, and you might have a unique situation where that's okay. Just, if you're using it every day, you'll get shot. Okay. <laughs> All right, the second topic we're going to discuss is the box model. Okay? CSS specificity is pretty straightforward, pretty easy to understand. Box model, a little bit more complex, but still makes sense. All right, we have two basic display types. There are more, but 95% of the time you will be using these two. You have stuff that's considered inline, and you have stuff that's considered block. And so if I had a document and I just put this asterisk, which is a unique, I should say, it's a unique thing. This actually has a specificity of zero. So it's saying like, if no other rules apply, use this. And so if this is the only CSS I had in this document, it would change all the elements into a inline, and it would say, it would flow like normal text and say, I am an inline element, okay? Inline stuff flows like normal text. That's the best way to think about it. Blocks, on the other hand, block out and you say, okay, I'm gonna have a a box element, a box model, and I'm going to stack on top of each other. Okay? And that's what these guys are doing. If I had a background for each one of these divs, it would come back and go all the way across and they would stack on top of each other. And so we have this box model. Okay? This is crucial to understand CSS, just when you run into bugs and weird things. So what the box model says is we have basically different layers to our boxes. We have our width and our height, and then on top of that we'll add any padding that we have. We will apply the background color to the width and the padding. We then have a border, and then we have a margin. Okay? This is always the same, unless you're like an IE4. This is always, <laughs> always, always the same. And so the, port, the reason why it's important to understand what these do is so you can understand when you're trying to design a shift and give shape to your divs and your elements is to understand where each of these come into part. We'll walk you through that right now. Okay, so say I have an element, div class equals hello, hello world, I give it a color, then I have my CSS, I give it a color of red. Okay, does that make sense? Does this make sense to everyone? Okay. Let's go ahead and we give a font size of 28, see if it's a little bit bigger. And I say, you know what, I want a background of red. And I want to make my, I got rid of the font color, and so it's going to default to black. And as you can see, this div, when you don't tell the div 
what type of dimensions to have. It will naturally try to fit horizontally as much as you can, and it will only take what it needs vertically. Okay? This is what is a data when you're not messing around with it looks like. Okay, and, and I say, you know what? I want my box. I'm really partial to 200 by 200 boxes. I don't know what it is. I think it's beautiful. <laughs> Add a pixel, it's horrible. Subtract a pixel, it's horrible. I want 200 by 200 on it. That's it. Okay? But then I say, you know what? This hello world, it's kind of scrunched up you know, on the top of that box. I want to bump this down so it's not as scrunched up in the top corner. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go give it some padding. And you say, wait a second. I'll bust up my ruler and say, gosh, girl, that's not 200 pixels. I gave it a freaking width of 200 pixels, and I'm looking at this thing, and it's not 200 pixels. First comment I misunderstood thing was the box model, width, height, and padding. Divs do not care. Do not, these two don't take each other into account. You don't care about each other at all. And so if we look at our box model, I have my width and my height. And then padding is added. And so what happens, I told them, I want this part to be 200 pixels, and then I want this part to be an extra 20 pixels. And with it, but because the background color is applied to all of it, my box, even though, it's, even though my browser is like, hey, it's what you told me to do, it looks 240. Does that make sense? And so if I go back to my box and say, you know what? I want it to be exactly 200 pixels. What I need to do I need to come over to these width and height and subtract 20 pixels. So if I have an image I want back here that's exactly 200 pixels, that's what I have to do. I have to do 40. Width of yeah, 40. 40. 40. 40. 40. 60. Yeah. Thank you. You guys are so smart. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a long day. So three presentations, a lot of videos on weekend. So it'll be one, 160, right? Okay. 160, 160, and then it would appear correct. Does that make sense? Excellent. Okay. I'm like, all right, you know what? Forget it. I'll be okay with this back the size of this box. I, 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 it's kind of grown on me. But I want five pixels. I add five pixels, and once again, if I go back and forth, it got bigger again because of the bo box element. So if I want it to be, once again, exactly a certain dimension, I'd have to subtract that from either the height, the width, or the padding. Okay? Now, so you know what? I'm not, I don't like white space. At least, this looks a little bare. I think we should make that go all the way across. And so I say, you know what? I want that width to be 100%. Once again, I see I have a nice little margin right here, black, red. What the? It goes up the end. Okay. Number two, 100% width. This gets people all the time. It gets me to this day. I'll be working a lot. Why did I do this? I'm like, ah. Oh. Okay. So let me explain. If you, go, if you go look back at our box model, Thank you. Once again, our width is right here. So what we're telling our, our width is when we give percentages, those percentages are the values of the parent element. So, so my parent element, we'll go back over here. My parent element is from here to about here. And then I said, I want that 100% to be applied to the inside of my width. Then I'll add the padding, then I'll add the border, and it'll run off the edge. Why doesn't it run off the, the other edge? Because this is everything goes to the top left, and so and naturally your site will always look good on the top left. Okay, <laughs> there is an exception to that width. The width will take into consideration the padding and the border if you don't give it a width. It'll naturally try and fill in, and with the natural filling, it does take into account the border and the padding. Why? I don't know. Ask Sheldon. But that's the way it works. And so if you want your site to look that way, that's what you're going to have to do. Okay, any questions about that? Wow. <laughs> it did. Well, it does. want that section out of the you shouldn't have told me to make it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, this, this, okay, it's a CS. It's Oh, Sheldon. All right, I'm going to go ahead and change the border to be blue. And then I add this declaration and say, hey, all my objects by default, including the page, the, uh, the body element, don't have, any, don't have any margin. So everything should go up 
nice and even. Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and give it a margin. This shorthand notation is just clock, clock clockwise. No, top, left, bottom, oh, top, top right, bottom, right. left. I went to school, I swear. <laughs> so, so I tell it, look, I have 10 pixels right here. I have 20 pixels on top and bottom. Everything's great. And I say, you know what? I want this height not to be so tall. I'll make this change, make the height 100 pixels. And I say, you know what? That's a really pretty box. I want two of them. Who doesn't want two of things? And so I'll add another one. And I go, okay, awesome. I got 20 pixels down here, 20 pixels at the top, 10, 10. Now, does it 20 plus 20 equal 40? Wait, does that look like 40 pixels to you guys? Okay, number three, margin collapse. Margin collapse will really, really make people mad. <laughs> so, um, and so and the thing is about margin collapse is that it's actually a good thing. It's important. When you read a newspaper, it flows naturally. Everything's spaced. Everything kind of looks right because you, you control it via those, those margins. And so the web says, hey, we're going to do the same thing. We want to have these margins. And so in your fire bugger, build, build two. if you hover over your element, you'll see my margin. It comes right here. And I'll see my margin again, right here. And that margin collapses. If I can share margin, I should share it. And so this is a good thing. Where the problem comes in is when you don't pay attention to where margins are touching, and they'll collapse. Here's an example I found online. I have my masthead, which is this element right here. I have my H1, my P. And I say, I want 20 pixels up here. I want 10, 10 pixels up here. I want, this is how I want it to look all nice and great. Is this how it's going to render? No. Nope. This is how it's going to render. And you're going to go, what the... Use a special word. I don't know which one we'll use. Hope it'll be darn it. I don't know. But but what happened is that so your your body element has margin. And these H1 and this H1 and the P have margin. And wherever it could, it shared that margin. Mm -hmm. And then applied the background. And so it looks all kind of short and funky. Okay? So even though margin is a good thing, when you're doing especially design work. Use padding where possible, because padding doesn't have that complication. So you can say, I want specifically 20 pixels down here, and any browser should give you those 20 pixels. And it's pretty consistent even in the IE world. Um, and so only use margins when you want that collapsing functionality. So if I was to have a new site, I try to keep the padding, I use that in all my designs, my boxes and stuff. When I got to the article part, and have that nice flow in my paragraphs, I would hit use margin. And what that will do is I'll cut down the times where margin will unexpectedly be touching and collapsing. Okay? Does that make sense? But padding carries the background color, so wouldn't you also... You have to take that into consideration. A lot of times what I've had to do in the past is I'll have to have, you know, a parent element that won't have the padding applied to it. Or it won't have the background applied to it. Do the padding and then inside do the background. There's different ways to solve that. Um, Could you get away with using a clear border? Uh, you could get away with using a clear border. What, where, where does that fall in the margin collapse? doesn't. That's a good idea. It's a really good idea. I wonder why I haven't thought about that before. I'm trying to, yeah, you can use a clear border, can't you? I'll have to look that up. Yeah. Maybe IE6 is good, right? That's why I never did it. I don't know. Most of my design days were in the IE6 days, and I had a battle scars to create. Okay. I know. Isn't this such a fun class? Okay, do we have any questions about the box model? Okay, I'll be 100% honest. I always get confused and I have to look it up. I'll have a link on the article. And then if you read that, you still have questions. You can ask me and I'll see if I can find some good examples. But off the top of my head, I'm on a blank. And so. But definitely, I, there's a link to an article to it, and if you still have questions, you always can email me. Okay, the third topic. This one's even, if, if, if we had, if the specificity was basic, box model was medium. This is kind of medium hard, and the reason why is, once again, once you understand it, it makes sense. 
but there's a couple of gotchas that you're like, why in the world does it work this way? Okay, I didn't have time to make these look pretty, so you'll have to just parse your own text in your brain. Okay, we're going to have HTML container. This container, we're going to have box one, box two, and box three. Each box will have a width and height of 100. Uh, the container has a padding of 200 around it, and each one of these have different backgrounds. They're red, green, and blue. One, two, and three. I felt smart after I made the slide that I realized I should have put the numbers in them, but that would have to require me to be smart. And uh, I just forgot. So here's the normal flow. Okay? Normal flow when you deal with floating is the most important, is very, very critical to understand. Normal flow out says is, hey, I am a parent and the elements, my children elements inside, will stack on top of each other if they have a a display type of box. And it's considered the normal flow. They'll never go to the left, never go to the right, they'll always stack on top of each other unless you float them yourself. Okay? That's the deck of the default way it works. Okay, when you go to float properties, uh, you have a couple options. You can do, you can have three values, or four. You can float something to the right, the left, you can inherit your float from your parent, or you can do none. 99% of the time, you can be doing these two. And you can say, hey, I want to take this element. I want to float to the right. I want to float to the left. This block element will be shifted to the left or right of the content. <coughs> the parent's element, content will float around the element. Um, or, the, yeah, the, the parent's element's content. Is that right, that right? Yeah, content will float on the element unless they use a clear attribute. And then here's the critical one. The floated element is removed from the normal flow. Normal flow. And so, once again, this is the normal flow. flow. When we float stuff that way, it'll be a little bit different. And so what happens is when you float one thing, normally it looks right and it's, it's working just fine. I went over here to my one, float, float right. And so I have floor over to the right. My green and blue are in the, are in the normal flow still. My parent element looks all nice. And say, hey, that's, that's a pretty good looking uh, website right there. You know what, though? I want, all I want is this blue box to go right here. Dear browser God, just do that for me. <laughs> so I go, I'm going to float this blue box. What the heck? <laughs> it was over here, and this parent element flowed down just nicely. I move it, just, just this guy over here, and all of a sudden my parents acting all weird. And there's reasons for that, and I'll show you exactly why, but it's because we removed this from the normal flow. And so, when you remove something from the normal flow, the parent is unaware of it. The example I, I like to use is like with kids. You know, the kids are aware of each other. They know how to get around and stack and, and move around each other. The parents have no idea. Kids, they know when the other kids are sneaking around the house at night, Parents, no idea. So the kids will always know what their brother and sister are doing. The parents, not a clue. And so that's the, the way I like to look at it. When I start floating an element, the parent has no idea it's there. So I'm like, so, oh, it's not, okay, you know what? I'll take that green. Okay. So I took my box one, floated it to the right, took my box two, my green one, I float it to the left, and I take my three, float it to the right, and now my parent, it looks, it's like, what is it doing? I don't understand what this is doing. It has no content whatsoever. And that's because, because all three elements are floating, that this parent, it thinks doesn't have any kids in the house. It's like, oh, there's no one here, even though there is. And as humans, as we're seeing this, we're like, look, this should be said now. That's the normal expectation in our minds. And so, the way to solve that is to you add a, a child element that has the class that has uh, that that we do the clearing with. So here's the way I do it in HTML. I added a, a, a div at the very bottom of these three, and I say, hey, class equals clear. And then in my CSS, what I did is I went over uh, down here at the bottom, and I said, hey, this child element it should clear both left and right, which means let them float and do whatever the heck they want, and when they're done floating above me, I want, I want to be right here. And so even though we don't see this element, 
to the browser, it's like, oh, there's a child element. To the parents, it's like, oh, there's a child element. I don't know why he's all the way down at the bottom with no space whatsoever, but because he's there, I will now behave like a sand, a, you know, same box and go all the way down to the bottom. Does this make sense? Excellent. So let's say, so let's, let's go over here and say, you know, I wanted this blue box to be down here below. And so I tell this blue box, which is this one right here, I want you to float to the right, but I also want you to clear to the right, saying, hey, let all the elements floating above you to the right do their thing, and then I want to start below them. That's, what, that's all that means. So now I have, hey, you know, my original goal is I wanted to have green, red, and blue. And it took a little bit more trickery to get to work. This is what I was expecting to see. Okay? Any questions about floating? Does the clear always go at the end then? Uh, typically, yes, unless you, for some reason, you want your parent element not to go all the way down. There might be a design reason you want to do that. But 95% of the time, the, you will want to at the bottom. All right. You put two clears in to space. Can you, can you go back out. a little bit? Yeah, okay. yeah, so, so I'll, I need a good quick drink here. Recharge. So where's the clear listed in the HTML? So if you go back to the HTML, uh, right here. I put it here at the bottom. And so, I have these three children, and then I have another child that will belong to the normal flow because they're not floating anywhere. So, you so the parent can be aware of it. Okay. But yeah, so I think it, I think it's the clearing element. The way it ends up working is if you have more than one element floating inside of a parent, you have to clear it. So if there's only one thing floating inside of that parent, then the parent would be aware of it. Yeah. And it would. Extend, but once you add another floating element, then you have to tell it to clear for it to yeah. wrap all the way around. The, the, the parent element needs to have a child it's aware of, and that's what that clear element so, does. So if you want to create, hypothetically, a, another section of that below within that parent, you'd have to add another clear yep. underneath those three divs. So you'd have to do another, you'd have to do it again. Yeah, and so if, and I wish I wish keynote would be live edit, that'd be cool. But if I went to that clear on element and I said, yeah, give it a height of 10 <coughs> pixels and give it a background of black, you would see a 10 pixel black line right here. But because the div has no content inside of it, it doesn't it doesn't have any vertical height, any vertical space to it. Okay? Oh, yes. Uh, so a couple of your other options, if you want to add new content. If you always know the height of these guys, like these are always the same, like they're always going to be this size, you know, they're always going to be the same dimension, you could actually give the parent manually to describe, hey, I want you to have a content height of 100 pixels. And then that would automatically go down. The trouble with that is a lot of times these elements aren't always going to be the same dimensions, and that's when you can't rely on manually doing that. If, there's another way. Yeah, tips. Okay. Uh, if you just add auto flow auto to the parent. It's, yes. And it works. That's yes. And that's something post IE6. <laughs> so I guess that's, that's kind of why I don't do it. But you're right. That is correct. And it works really well. And um, what, what was that? I couldn't hear. The auto flow uh, auto. So yeah, so normal overflow you could do is you could give us a specific dimension and say overflow hidden, and so any extra stuff would hide. So when you say overflow auto, it says hey, you know, pay attention to these inside objects and, 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 and have this object flow with them. Um, and so it's, and I'm not a thousand percent sure on the, how how that works across all the different browsers. Has is it working on E7? There's some of the text right now. <laughs> Thank you very much. 
All right. Any other questions? Excellent. All right. Okay, I'm looking at floating. Okay, we do have a couple other compass conceptions. Uh, I won't cover them right now. There's stuff I have links in my article that you can look at. Element positions. Uh, once you understand and get it, it makes once again like all of the CSS stuff it makes whole sense. But the naming conventions are a little weird. Sometimes what I would assume one would do is actually the other one does it. Um, but I will I link the article on how to do that. Another common tricky one is vertical and horizontal centering. Uh, horizontal centering is not too not too tricky. It makes if it seems kind of weird. You, took, you give your margins a um, auto, and it'll kind of auto fill based on on the on the uh, space available. Vertical, there's a bunch of different ways you can do it. They're all kind of weird, I think. And um, there's articles on how to do that depending on what your needs. Uh, but I probably take a whole class to explain how to do that. All right, okay, now, CSS isn't all blah, and I hate using this, or it's just a pain to use. There are some really cool fun tools coming out with them. Who here are familiar with CSS preprocessors? Really? Okay. Like less, yeah, less. Okay. So the one I've been kind of interested in the most has been less. There's a couple other I'll show, like SAS, Stylus, and one other I don't remember the name of. All the designers I work with refuse to use raw CSS since they started using less. Yeah. And and we'll, we'll go through a couple examples. Um, a couple cool things you can do with less and the syntax. The difference between less SAS and stuff, there are some, I guess underneath the hood, there are some big differences, but when you look at it as a user, it's more of a syntax thing. But what you can do with less, the way it works is say, hey, I'm going to declare a variable, color, and I say, hey, I want my header to have this color, and I want my H to have this color. No more search and replace for your stupid headless code. <laughs> it is awesome. And especially if you have two color, two different variables that have the same color, and really you want to have to switch only one of them, this works great. And so the way CSS preprocessors work is with less either you can add a JavaScript file that it will go through and do it manually for you, or there's some command line tools that you can say, hey, go through and look at all my less files and compile them for the CSS, and then I'll push them up to the server. Um, and there's a lot of good articles on that website on how to do that. But when you compile it, so when, when the browser gets to it, it doesn't see this. You know, it doesn't know this notation. And it's like, I could care less. All it sees is this. Okay? You have things called mix-ins. Uh, oh, crap, I copy and paste didn't work. I'll, I'll go up and show an example of uh, mix-in here in a second. That looks like the coolest thing. <laughs> You can also do nesting, nesting, nesting rules. It's always been kind of odd when I have like a header h1, a span, blah, 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 I don't care. You know, like header p, a hover, and I can care less, that's a lot to write out. But you have nested rules, so it'll automatically assume that, hey, here's my header, I want the h1 to have mm -hmm. this font size and this weight, I want my p tag to have this font size, and if any links inside there, I don't want to have any underlining. And if on the hover, I want to add a border of one pixel. And when it comes, and then after it goes to the preprocessor, like the compiler, this is what comes out. Completely valid CSS. And the great thing is with less files and stuff, and all of them, you can you can actually write this in here, and it would work just fine. So it's not like it doesn't break anything with CSS. It's just like short notation that makes it so much easier. So. It's very simple cool to check out. Uh, another one is SAS. Um, between SAS and, and, and less, uh, I kind of lean towards la uh, less, but SAS is, you know, they're 95%. Don't tell anyone, don't tell either of these teams. They're 95% the same, I think, uh, from a user perspective. It's just how they accomplish it underneath the hood that they debate about. And I care less. I just want less to look fine. All right, okay, a couple final thoughts, and then we'll go, uh, any last questions? Here's my recommended book, 
This is the book that before I read it, I said, I hate CSS. I don't understand it. This is ridiculous. Just, ah, oh, I hated it. I read this book. It's only about this thick. Not very good. Read by a guy named Andy Budd, who is really, really smart. He's a, he's a UX guy. He's, he's a really great guy. Who is a, he's, a, he's from England. I read this book, and, I, and it changed the light bulb from, ah, oh, this is really confusing. I don't understand CSS, to, I get it. And so I recommend this to everyone who does web design, web development, if you're a back end guy, even if you're a system administrator. Maybe. You know, <laughs> you, get, you, sh you should read this book. Um, you know, it's available online, you get know, on Amazon, you get know, yeah, Barnes and Noble. But when I went to Barnes and Noble, I don't have a picture on here, but I went to Barnes and Noble, there's like 50 billion books on CSS. And then all the other ones are just okay. This one definitely is, has a high, it's very potent, I would say. It's very thin, but it's packed with really, really good information. You explain the concept, show the common pitfalls, and how to fix them. And so, get this book. I'm not endorsed to say this. This is just, <laughs> it's worth the $20 of sanity. You know, you can spend thousands of dollars at a psychiatrist. <laughs> Go ahead and get this. Every CSS guy I know is working on the yeah. same book. I've got it. One of these days, I'll even read it. <laughs> yeah, you should. And I read one chapter. It's good and it helped, actually. <laughs> <laughs> See, even read just the first chapter. Okay. This is a website done by Chris Coyer. And it's called CSS Trick. If you like to be kind of more cutting edge, bleeding edge, kind of where new trends are coming up or new techniques, they will appear here almost first, almost always. He's, he has a good pulse on the, on the design community. And he's also very good at saying, Here's something cool that maybe in five years you will be used. Here's something cool that you can use right now. Here's something cool that is supported in most browsers and you probably be safe using on a normal production site. It fails over easily. It doesn't look ugly. He's pretty good about saying, you know, here's cool, oh my gosh, I love, you know, kind of make the internet happy, and here's cool, make the boss happy. <laughs> so um, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Is it css-tricks.com or? css-tricks.com. And uh, I should show you that there's a bug in my in my uh, everything's lying with my keynote where it puts checkerboards over my next slides, which is really helpful because next slide can't I don't know what the next slide is. <laughs> All right, okay, this is actually up right now. If you go to justcarvingcom forward slash CSS, has the, has the slides, it has links to articles I did all my research with. And if I ever hear any or see anything new, I'll kind of post it on this article. And so instead of having to furiously write down everything, just write this one thing down. And you can get all the additional information and more about this presentation. And that's about it for this presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Yes. Have you ever heard of uh, Compass, the CSS offering framework? I I have, I've heard of it, I haven't used it. Um, I, part of the problem, a little bit, is the last three years, so I, I, did, I do a lot of, I had done a lot of design um, for a lot of different companies. Last three years I kind of switched to like APIs only. And so a lot of the brand new stuff that's come out, I'm not as familiar with. Um, it's open source, it's compass-style.org. I'll have to check it out. You know, but it's, it, my gut is something similar, kind of like what is like Backbone JS is the JavaScript. Is it, yeah, yeah, making it, you know, because websites get so complicated now, it's nice to have a framework to, to, I know where my styles are instead of going through 20 different files and saying, where to put the stupid thing. Especially if you compile it into one single CSS file and then figure out which file it got compiled from. All right, yes? Uh, another really good website that Jazz Fiddle. Yes. That is really, this, that's the one where you can, uh, like, live. Yeah, you put in the HTML, the JavaScript, and the CSS, CSS and auto. It shows you what it will do. Yes, that's it. I'm going to make sure I write that one down in the article. That's an excellent. That's what I, I think the most useful thing for people who are learning CSS, trying to at least overcome it, is to take something that's, like, my example, something, it's stripped down to bare, bare necessities and say, okay, today I'm going to learn how positioning works. And position to see what happens and, 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 
and do a one-to-one. -one. There's a lot of people that have to write to one of the CSS declarations, rules, and then you'll have a funny bug and you're like, okay, which of the 20 things that I just changed or add made these changes or caused it? And so, you see what we add. And that will help you a lot. All right. Any other questions or comments? I've never used less or SAS. Is there like a, a library or a file you can download and include, or is there a so, you have to? I, I'm most familiar with less. The easiest way to use less, and it's, and I would recommend this for a large production site, but if you're using this to like on your blog or whatever, less has a JavaScript library, so what you do is you include that file after you've included all your CSS, and it'll go through and look for the less files, go through and compile them into the CSS, add them back in, and it'll render. For you, um, and then there is like here's like uh, a Mac or Windows, whatever. We do have a command line tool. Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head how you install it. The website. Uh, the easiest way is to run is if you use if you've got Node.js installed, npm install less. Yes. Look at it. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of uh, frameworks such as well Node.js Express. There's a less middleware for that that will automatically if you try to access the URL that ends in .css. And there's a .less file of the same name that will automatically compile it for you. I, I'm pretty sure there's some for Ruby, and I know mm -hmm. I've seen some for PHP as well. Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I've seen, there, I think it's less where we have, I think it's less for SAS, but there's a, they're actually working on writing a Apache mod, module, so that it'll just automatically, if it sees a less file, it'll automatically compile it for you. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you guys so much. We're done a little bit early, but. I'd rather let you guys go early instead of boring you for 10 minutes. Thank you. If you have any recommendations for our presentation, we, we weren't able to get joined in for the conference this year, but if you, have, if you liked it or if you have any direct feedback, say it would be better to do this or this is good, this is bad, um, just let me know. Uh, I'm always looking to find ways to be better for this. Thanks.